Hi everybody, this is Jane Patrick with Shack Spindle Company. Uh, we're celebrating Spinning and Weaving Week all week, and this is our week to just really enjoy and celebrate the thing that we love to do. I'm Jane Patrick with Shack Spindle Company, and today joining me is Liz Gibson. So, um, hi Liz, thanks for joining us. <laughs> um, you may know Liz if you know about Yarn Worker. She is the sole um, proprietor, owner, one woman band, maybe you'd say, of um, Yarn Worker. And we're going to want to hear more about that today. But Liz has just a huge background in weaving and spinning, or mostly weaving. She was a managing editor at Handwoven, and I think a spin off too, right? Mm -hmm. Right. And then she was in a uh, sales manager at Shack Spindle Company. And then she went off and was a producer for Craftsy. And um, of course, all the books that she's written and the workshops she's taught. And, um, you know, I think now your main focus is Yarn Worker, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. So um, pretty much teaching. Yeah. So I want you to talk a little bit about how you got into weaving, because as a child, you, you talk about you just loved yarn and were involved in that. And then at some point you migrated to weaving. And then how did the rigid heddle become the loom that was your specialty? Yes. So um, what is our yarn origin story? <laughs> right. How did, how did we find the loom? Um, so I was exposed to weaving in a really specific contest context when I was a kid. So randomly, my mom um, got a job as an occupational therapy aide at the, um, in the psychiatric ward at the University of Virginia Hospital. And um, they let me go to work with her, which was really amazing on a lot of different levels. So this was a, a huge room with looms and potter's wheels. And um, the goal was for patients to come and feel better. So there was a, a, a mental health component to it and there was a, a physical rehabilitation component to it. And these are things that you take in as a you know, preschooler. I didn't really understand that context, but Cindy Lally, who ran that workshop, I learned later, you know, she learned through Mary Atwater's newsletters, had this kind of, because Mary Atwater was so in, entrenched in occupational therapy and um, she had these huge glamoker looms and she would throw the shuttle and I would run around to the other side and catch it. So she was always finding ways to include everybody in the process. Um, and that stuck. And my, uh, my parents were divorced. I grew up with these two polar worlds too that sat together. So my dad blew up his TV and moved to the country and raised his own food. And, you know, we had animals and um, that was a huge part of, the makery, he was the maker in the family. And um, my mom had restaurants and was involved in media. So she was, had a television show and did theater and was a journalist. So this sort of idea of media and makerism and fiber and, um, but the core of that was really weaving as, as medicine. You know, weaving is something that makes us feel better. And so I pursued it in many, many ways <laughs> until I could find, uh, a job perhaps, but I uh, went to school um, at Colorado State University with the intention of applying for the occupational therapy program, did not get in. So wandered over to, um, I was taking a minor in fiber arts at the time, which just meant it was the only place looms where I was very lucky to find Tom Lumberg. He welcomed me in with open arms um, and uh, ended up looking at in um, social economics and looking at value-added agriculture and did my senior project at Tierra Wolves here in New Mexico. So just, uh, you know, trying things on until uh, I landed a job at Interweave. And that sort of set me on the um, how to craft teaching space um, and all that it is and all the other things that you said sort of followed from there. Yeah. So, um you know, with this very background, you somehow got led to do yarn worker, right? So how did all that, I mean, how did you decide that that's something you want to do? I mean, that's a huge thing to start your own business and carry it forward. Um, but all these other things somehow prepared you, I guess. Yes. 
And Jane, I don't know if you know it or not, but when I worked there, you said, you should run your own business. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. So there you go. Thank you, Jane. Um, it really, you know, like all of our businesses, right? Mary didn't intend to start a manufacturing business. You know, we, we sort of, Yarn Worker was a website um, when I was freelancing, it was a place to have a home base. So it was a place to really um, celebrate my love of weaving. And of course, you know, I had books out there. Um, I had thought of it as being maybe a pattern publishing platform because there weren't many places where you could buy rigid huddle specific patterns, right? Mm -hmm. So um, we didn't have the special issues from handwoven yet. You know, we were, it, it's, you know, patterns drive so much. But um, as you may know, even with all my publishing history, pattern writing has never been my first love. It's always been video production and teaching. So I've always thought in terms of moving pictures. Um, and, and because of this sort of varied background, I had those skills and um, yarn worker, which simply put, if folks don't know, is, is two things. It's a, a website that promotes rigid huddle know-how for just the love of the loom. And then I have the yarn worker school, which is an online weaving school specifically for rigid huddle weavers. And that came about, like all things, very serendipitously. Um, it's a community funded school where we host quarterly weave alongs. I have skill building workshops, but it started because I was teaching a lot on the road all the time. And um, a large box of my teaching samples, I shipped them for the first time ever, right? We never do that, we always carry them, but I was doing multiple gigs and I thought, what could go wrong? Well, they went missing. So you can appreciate all the educators out there. It's a nightmare. Oh, it was, it, you know, it was no, there was a train derailment. It was UPS. They, they returned the box, but it was crushed. And I, I still have, I still have pieces with, you know, ro road rash on it. <laughs> so um, it was, it was a thing. And on a whim, I just happened to be having a double weave workshop coming up from interweave. I said, Hey, does anyone want to reweave this sample with me? Right. Why not? I'm either going to quit or I'm going to keep going. And so there was a huge response to that. And in a year we filled up the box. So they were very informal weave alongs, you know, blog posts and um, Facebook group and Ravelry page. But as a teacher, you know, you want to give your students more. And so um, this amazing group of people who had been weaving with me helped me found a Patreon group and funded what the school is today, which is a more robust online weaving platform, which huzzah, I guess, well primed for a pandemic. <laughs> so, um, but it really is, I try to really throw the doors open wide with the weave along. So there's, there's no charge for them while they're active. So really um, there's so many barriers to learning to weave. You know, you got to find a loom. You got to get the yarn. It sounds like you need this special kind of yarn. Then you got to figure out how to set it up. Then you have, now of all the looms, we know the rigid huddle loom is the most teach myself friendly, right? It's very possible to teach yourself all these things through the resources just that come with the loom itself. Um, but even deciding how you make that choice for the rigid huddle loom, um, which I think was the other part of your question, sort of how did I decide that this loom spoke to me um, and probably similar to your own story of how the loom <laughs> speaks to you because you really championed it. You know, there's this sort of lineage we have from, you know, Betty and yourself and um, Ann Field and um, who really discovered if you're going to celebrate weaving, it's, it's to me the sweet spot between that frame loom and that floor loom. So between all the handwork and all the mechanical assist, you have this ingenious tool, which is really a 20th century invention that um, is very yarn friendly, very uh, beginner friendly, portable, doesn't keep, you know, I, when I was a floor loom weaver, I was out in the back behind my loom all the time. You know, my loom could not go where I went. And that was a huge piece for me as well. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I got into Rigid Heddle. Um, I took over Robin Darty's classes at the city of Boulder. And I didn't even know anything about the rigid home. She just was wanted to retire and said what I do it. So I had to learn what it was before I taught it. And then I learned 
that there were many floor loom weavers that really didn't consider the rigid heddle loom a real loom. Like, it's not really weaving. And so I guess um, I'm kind of contrary. Um, I just wanted to prove them wrong. I mean, you know, it's still, you can weave on it, it's a loom. So I really, um, after I first started teaching those classes, I realized the value, especially for new beginning teachers or weavers, um, students, that they um, could get the concepts really easy and they weren't so overwhelmed um, like with floor loom weaving. There's just more steps, right? Um, so I, I always felt um, in the beginning um, that I had to champion the loom. And I think that's changed a lot, thanks to you and a lot of other people at Betty Davenport. And, um, and I think one thing that Betty Davenport, especially when I was um, editor of Handwoven and she was contributing a lot of projects back then, she was a really good designer. And I think people saw like, you can do this on a rigid head of loom. And I think that inspired a lot of people. Yes. Yeah, it is. I, I often, often say weaving is not determined by the loom, but by the weaver, right? It, weaving is interlacements. And so um, when we place value judgments on it that way, we, we just sort of limit our own curiosity about how weaving is constructed. Because we all share the yarn, you know, yarn selection, project planning, shuttle, make color work, shuttle. I mean, that's truisms of all weaving. And so how you pick up those skills and what loom speaks to you is, is all weaving. And then I think we do need to see the path forward. Um, you know, the other question you get is, well, what can you make besides a scarf? And, you know, my answer is always, what can't you make? <laughs> you know, I mean, we've done rugs, we've done blankets, we've done wraps, we've done, you know, really anything you can make with yarn. Um, and we do know weaving, you know, excels at making um, flat things, right? So knitting excels at making sculpt shaped things. So, you know, they have their areas, but it's, it's just always very curious to me. I think it's just how weaving has developed in the U.S. specifically and over in terms of this, most of the educational materials available are geared towards a floor loom weaver. So the fact that we have more patterns, more teachers, more resources means that um, that kind of attitude isn't quite as prevalent anymore. Right, and, and I think um, what we've seen um, is that rigid heddle weaving has brought so many people into the field. And those people may weave on their rigid heddles for the rest of your, their lives, and that's fine. But some of those people then want to do floral loom, floral loom weaving and the, the, the transition from one to the other isn't so hard once they understand really how weaving works. Well, and that what I have to admit, I came to rigid huddle weaving as a floor loom weaver. You know, that was my training. That was my background. That was my love. And um, there was this feeling at the time when I wrote Weaving Way Easy, it was really let's trick them into weaving. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Let's give them this easy access. And then, you know, you'll be, but in the process, what I very much learned and didn't know the uh, 15 so years since that book came out is that, um, you know, you just start finding your path, you know, that people weren't just going to keep moving along, that this in itself was a whole legit place to be mm -hmm. for very, a lot of reasons. And as a materials person, you know, I am a spinner. I love yarn, structural yarn, you know, colors. It, this loom excels at that because the loom waste, you know, it's gentler on yarn. So you have a, you have huge benefits to using the loom in terms of if you come from the knitting side, if you're a hand spinner, if you like art yarns, um, all of those really speak to this is a good loom for you. Mm -hmm. Right. So it seems that what you've done with the iron worker is to really create a welcoming and safe place for people that the help come and to the school. So, I mean, to me, yarn worker seems like a community, like you've created a community. Um, and what's your perception? Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. Yarn worker is, I, I like to think of it as a learning space. And it is, um, you know, 
one of the things in this world that makes us feel better is when we connect with our tribe and people who connect around the enthusiasms that we're really specific about. And I think Yarn Worker also offers focus because you know, community implies all kinds of things, which we hope I'm welcoming and, but it, it, we really stay focused on these specifics. And in that sense, our brains aren't inundated with so much. And we can have really substantive conversations and learning around something we're really excited about. Whereas we go into more of a mixed group. I mean, we all know, you know, I go to, a, you know, a party, which they're on Zoom now. And they say, what do you do? And I say, I'm a weaver. And they say, oh, where do you sell your work? And I say, well, I make weavers. That's my job. <laughs> you know, I'm not, but usually a weaver, you know, the eyes kind of glaze over. You know, I mean, people don't feel as passionately about us. And when you say you're a rigid heddle loom weaver, that's even way more specific. So I really tried to create, I mean, we, ha we have a study group and seminars and the classes where, where we can get pretty specific and um, focused and really know we're talking to people who speak our language, which even in a larger, I mean, bless guilds, you know, guild, you have so many enthusiasm, you have your spinners and you have your, you know, AVLs and you have your, you know, and your rigid huddle that there's fiber and dying and, you know, it's, you've got all this going on. So we get really, 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 really nichey. <laughs> Calms the mind. Right. So talk about what you're working on now. And I, um, I think you are starting a new weave along or you just had a weave along. Yeah, we just wrapped up a weave along. We did weft face color work. So we looked specifically looked at some of those breed specific hardy rug wools. So we were weaving little, you know, rugs. Um, I call them my oversized coasters, but things where you could really utilize some of those um, firm rugs. And then we talked about sizing them up. This is the fourth time we've tackled a rug format because that's, a, you know, rag rugs and uh, larger. So how to scale them up. Once you've mastered the techniques on a smaller scale, how do you go big? Um, so you can still register for that at yarnworkerschool.com. It's free until the end of the month and check out all the information. And then coming up, we're doing um, tubular double weave. So we're constructing a bag entirely on the loom. So, um, cool. you know, you can do the seams and the flaps and the bottom. And so it's a real small project. So it's a good way to get into um, double weave and then sort of all the little components of double weave within it too. So that's coming up in uh, October. Yeah, October 21st, I think registration opens. So your last book was the Weaver's Guide to Yarn that you self-published? Yes. And, yeah. and um, we actually saw that checked and it's very popular. Yay. Yeah. Well, and so are you working on another book? I think you said once to me that um, your books come out of the needs of your students. Yes. I mean, so much of A Weaver's Guide to Yarn was really after, you know, four years of blogging and, you know, writing articles. I mean, you can appreciate this and teaching and, you know, you feel you... I feel like I get, have the largest laboratory, you know, um, it's, it's a lab for me and it's like, oh, okay, this helps make that clear. Okay, this is where the concerns are. Okay, this is the gap because, um, th and that's where pattern writing never sort of scratched my itch because it didn't speak to that underlying know-how you needed. It created an inspirational project, but it didn't kind of get to all those edges. And so A Weaver's Guide to Yarn was really bringing together the most common questions I get and, and putting them into one format around yarn selection and measurements and properties and fiber. And um, so I have enough, I mean, I have a couple avenues, you know, the yield writer's block. So I, I, the patron community has really helped. I write for them. I talk to them. We do, you know, some, we have a study group. And so it just, um, is allowing me to coalesce some things around. Um, I'm not sure what it'll be yet. So <laughs> I guess that's okay. the easiest. I have ideas, <laughs> but you know, those ideas sometimes take a while to birth. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, we'll see when, when it's available, it's available, right? <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, so I mean, this, during this time, I mean, it's, it's good that your business is mostly online. I know you're not teaching at community college or going traveling teaching at all right now. So, I mean, what would you say, you know, do you have observations or thoughts about weeding during the pandemic? 
Yeah, it's so, I mean, the weaving as medicine has never been truer. And I think the other part is weaving is very much an aspirational craft. I think a lot of people have weaving on their list. When I retire, I'm gonna weave. When my kids graduate from college, I'm gonna weave. When I'm, you know, I'm gonna weave. We, we tend to start in our 20s, you know, we, we do something, makerism, and then, you know, life, career, families, those things can um, distract. And also the fact, you know, weaving can move around. So I think now some folks have time, they're home more. Um, they, they are also thirsting for that connection. Um, and and I, weaving to me is very contemplative. Now that does not mean I sit at my loom like, you know, calm and serene and weave away. A lot of podcasts are happening, but I think we need tactile. Um, our Zoom life is providing us with one kind of connection. And I think online can be very warm and friendly. I think that's also helped break the barrier, pandemic weaving that we think of it as being cold and distant. But actually, it's highly connective because like Mary Atwater's newsletters, we don't have weaving teachers or a weaving shop or a weaving community in the places we live. And so it's made it easier for us to find those resources, um, particularly more video-based resources um, that help us get us over our stuck places when we're at home and we can't figure out, well, how do I get to the next step? Um, and, you know, of course you can go into these amazing groups and you ask the question, you get 32 answers. <laughs> you know? So it's like, oh my gosh, you know, you know okay, now I got some ideas. Um, so, I, and I, I hope, you know, going back to how I first experienced weaving, it has always been um, the grounding force of my life. Not just the contemplative nature of it, but its connection to history, its connection to everything. I mean, you can really make, I mean, I teach at the you know, um, New Mexico Tech, which is a science and engineering university, weaving. And when you teach those students, I really highlight, you know, textiles and technology. It's, there's a huge force of, and, but the mechanics haven't changed. So what happens in a, a mill is the same thing that we are really doing on our loom. So it helps give them that tactile experience. So no matter what you do in your life, if you're a programmer, if you're an artist, if you are a scientist, if you are a social worker, if you are whatever it is that you do, there's, there's an avenue for cloth making that supports your work in that way. Um, and I, I you know, relish the opportunity to give people that know-how that just helps them figure out whatever kind of weaver it is that they wanna be for themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I think right now, you know, weaving is in textiles in general, it's really coming to the forefront, as you say, in, in many areas, like you're teaching more technical people. But what, right now we're working with the University of Colorado on a project um, in there. It's called the Unstable Lab, and they are working on textiles and uh, electrical circuits and, you know, programming of textiles to be smart. And it's really been interesting to see their process of understanding how textiles work. Because you think all these people, all so much of our world is centered around textiles, but the majority of the population doesn't even think about them. So I think we're lucky in that sense. We understand how important they are in our lives. Food, clothing, and shelter. I mean, when we think of the fundamental and clothing meaning, you know, rugs, blankets, the cloth, those are the essentials of living. And so cloth is a huge piece of that pie and how it gets made. And that includes cars or cloth, right? Fiber, you know, fiberglass, fiber construction um, is in a lot of those areas. And I think weaving in particular is a binary craft. You know, it's based on the binary system. So technology has this special place, the jacquard loom, that you know, long connection to it. So you know, you, you ha I don't like to put things in right and left brain thinking because a lot of my students like Einstein, they really relish weaving because they solve their problems when they're busy doing something else. Mm -hmm. you know, if you have a problem in your life and you, you focus on it and you're trying to fix it, you can't fix it. If you go weave for a while, you'll fix it quicker. 
you know, um, you know our son used to play the violin. You know, we, we need these areas in our life, whatever it is, if it's cooking, if it's bricklaying, if it's building wall, you know, gardening, whatever it is, um, it's, it's a very, very important part of the human experience. I agree. Um, Liz, anything else you want to say to our people? Um, uh, happy spinning and weaving week. Um, weave, spin, be happy. And thank you so much to Shaq for building such amazing tools. Um, I, I was really a wonderful part of my life to be part of a company for a while and um, continue yeah, to use great. those tools. <laughs> so um, to find Liz, just go to yarnworker.com. And if you want to see this interview um, or learn more about Spain and Weaving Week, just go to shackspindle.com. This interview will appear in our Weave Along for Spain and Weaving Week, so you can grab it there. Um, and I, too, send you great greetings for Spain and Weaving Week. May you all spend the week celebrating um, the crafts you love with the people that are doing it with you. Bye-bye.